Today on the Locked On Hornets podcast, General Manager Mitch Kupchak speaking to the media after the trade of Terry Rozier to the Miami Heat. Does this signal a rebuild or a retool? And what will they do next? That's all ahead today on the Locked On Hornets podcast. Let's get it. We're Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. In a minute, cause we live. We live. We live. <laughs> It is Locked On Hornets on a Wednesday. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every single day. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more right now. New customers can bet $5 and get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. Thanks so much for making Locked On Hornets your first listen every day. We are free and daily wherever you get your podcast, and that includes YouTube, where you can see my bright, shining face as the Hornets get set to get back on the floor after the trade of Terry Rozier and face off against the worst team in the NBA, the Detroit Pistons. I'm going to have more on that game later in the show, but obviously we are going to continue to talk about the one of the bigger stories around the NBA as the Hornets kick off uh, a major part of the trade deadline festivities by moving Terry Rozier to the Miami Heat in exchange for Kyle Lowry and a lottery protected 2027 pick that if it does not convey becomes a 2028 uh, unprotected pick. So we did a lot of analysis of that deal in uh, yesterday's show and Mitch Kupchak did get in front of the media and had some things to say. I did not, I don't think, reveal anything uh, uh, incredible about this deal, but I do think there are some insights we can pull here about the future direction of this franchise, whether it involves Mitch Kupchak moving forward or not. And the big question, I think, on a lot of fans' minds at this point after the Hornets move Terry Rozier is A, what's next? And, and a sort of a sub-question off of that, does the move of Terry Rozier and any subsequent moves, will they be moves towards a full rebuild of this franchise? Or is it going to, and, and rebuild meaning, you're tearing everything down except for you know one or two young pieces that you like. You're taking on bad money to acquire more draft assets. Your plan is over the next few years to be bad and to uh, rebuild a core of players via the draft. Or is it a retool where you use some of those assets that you acquire in some of your first trades to then turn around and bring on more veteran players that could actually allow that young core that you already have to develop and win some basketball games, not in five years, uh, but in, in the next few seasons. And so that was the one of the questions immediately asked to Mitch Kupchak, and I'm going to read you. This is a long quote, long-winded answer, but I want to read all of it, and then we'll kind of break it down piece by piece. So here's what he said. Well, it's definitely not a rebuild, okay? We think we've got a foundation of players in place, of course. I'm not going to mention all the players, but I'll mention our two highest picks. It just makes sense. LaMelo Ball and Brandon Miller. But there are other players that we've pegged as players that would be very difficult to trade. And like I said, I don't want to mention all the names, but we do feel that. And then we've got some veteran players still under contract that are still, we drafted them four years ago, but they're not even 25 yet. So we do have, I think, a good group for various reasons. Most of all, the injury scenario this year, we weren't able to really see what kind of team we had or reach whatever potential we thought we had. And we had hoped that we would contend for one of those lower level playoff spots. That was our hope. Never got a chance to put together a run. And that's not to say that we still don't intend on trying to win games because we do. So I wouldn't call it a rebuild. Okay. A rebuild is, in my opinion, something where you start from scratch and you convert everything you have into draft capital and you create gobs of cap room and you start taking in contracts to get picks. And it could draft drag out years. That's not the case. I think it's more of a case of recognizing where we are this year. Going forward, just looking at our timeline, we had to be realistic. We had to be realistic as to the kind of year that Terry was having. And it's hard. It's hard to make a deal like this. When a guy has played as hard as he has on the court, rarely does he miss a game. Every time he goes in for a layup, he gets thrown to the ground and he does a side flip or whatever, and he gets up and runs back down the court. It's hard to say goodbye to a player like that, but these are the hard decisions you make in professional sports. So at the top of that quote, Mitch Kupchak definitively saying that in his opinion, this is not a rebuild. 
But I think anyone that has looked at, watched this team for the past couple of years and listened to Mitch Kupchak talk about this team, I think most of those people have come to the conclusion that Mitch Kupchak and maybe some other people in this organization have rosier colored glasses about the expectations for this team and what it could achieve than do anyone else watching. And he's certainly correct that injuries have stunted their ability to fully prove out the theory that Kupchak and the rest of the organization had, which was that a core of LaMelo Ball, Miles Bridges, P.J. Washington, Gordon Hayward, pre-Brandon Miller, that that core could achieve something, could get to the playoffs, taste that, and then you know pull vault off of that into something greater. They never even got to step one of that plan. But at the same time, there were glimpses of that core together, and and there was enough, I think, intel on each of those players individually to understand that all of them together collectively wasn't going to be enough. And and even when they entered this season fully healthy, uh, the the expectation from from Vegas was was not particularly kind to this team's chances of making the playoffs. And on top of that, when you don't fill that core with legitimate depth, whether it be back a point guard or the center position, you you leave yourself vulnerable because the margin with that core. Because you're not talking about a core that is filled. It's not a big three. It's not a big four. It's not a big two. It's barely a big one because you've got one guy who's made an all-star game in the past couple of years in LaMelo Ball. And he's dealing with some serious you know, injury comeback stuff, right? And so all of us, all of our eyes are telling us, hey, you know, the, the margin of error is slim for this team. You've got to fill it with depth and make sure that one or two injuries don't completely hamper your ability to make a playoff run. And they didn't do that. They didn't go and make the moves to fill center depth. They didn't go and make the moves to fill backup point guard depth. They allowed Dennis Smith Jr. to leave. They left themselves holes in terms of defensive prowess, in terms of physicality, the things that you need to survive an 82-game regular season and come out on the other end as w- what they wanted to accomplish, which was lower-level playoff team. He, he admitted it. They, they weren't trying to accomplish, let's build a team that can get a sixth seed. They went about building a team that could be a lower-level playoff team, play in team, sneak in, do something crazy, and then hopefully that would allow the young team to get experience, pole vault, and maybe convince a veteran that, hey, we've got a little sneaky core here like Atlanta did and, and, and move forward. But it didn't work. And now here again, I think everybody sees, okay, you're moving Terry Rozier. If you plan to move Gordon Hayward or Kyle Lowry and acquire more assets, you've got a, you've got a core – in Mark Williams, LaMelo Ball, Brandon Miller. But that's a young core. And a young core means question marks. You don't know how Mark Williams is going to develop as a player. Is he going to learn how to shoot? Um, LaMelo Ball, can he get back to an all-star game? Can he get to an all-NBA level? Can he stay healthy? Brandon Miller, can can he get size? Can he get stronger? So many positives with all three of those players, but also so many question marks. And so when you go with a young core like that, you are rebuilding. Because you are not with those three plus other young, cheap talent or bad contracts if you're acquiring assets, you're not going to win a lot of basketball games. That's a rebuild. And so this this feels very like 1984, big brother, you know, doublespeak kind of thing where he says, well, this is not a rebuild. It's a, it's a rebuild. If you plan to move those veterans and do not replace them with you know, replacement level talent and and your focus is on payroll and your focus is on draft capital and your focus is not on winning basketball games such that you get to the playoffs. If that's not the primary focus, then you are in a rebuild. You are not in a retool. You are in a rebuild. And so I don't know why he doesn't want to use that word, but it but it is in line, I think, With the approach that this organization has taken with fans, I would say, you know, even even looking back a few years before Mitch Kupchak took took over, I don't put this all on Kupchak. I think this was a this is a late Jordan era uh, ownership management of this team 
that is now leaking into the new ownership group and with this continued front office of, of going out in front of fans and in front of media, but the media will then move that to the fans like I'm doing right now, reading in this quote. And they're saying, what your eyes see, that deceives you. That's not what we're doing here. They're rebuilding and then telling you it's not a rebuild. Because to tell you a rebuild is to admit failure. To tell you it's a rebuild is to admit, hey, we brought Terry Rozier as step one as part of a process moving on when we rebuilt from Kimball Walker and that failed. And we never wanted to take responsibility for that. Even And it failed. It didn't fail this season. It failed, I mean, I would say in the second play-in blowout. That's when you go, hey, this team really doesn't, whatever they, whatever they were trying to build here, doesn't have it. Maybe it needs a coach. Maybe it needs uh, a defensive wing who, can, uh, who has some leadership quality. Uh, whatever it needs, it doesn't have. And they didn't want to come to terms with that. And it doesn't appear from that quote that they still want to come to terms with it. More ahead on the Locked On Hornets podcast, more quotes, including on whether part of this was the pairing of LaMelo and Terry together. Very interesting question. Great question asked to uh, Mitch Kupchak. Want to give you the, the answer on that. Plus, what will they do next? Was this a financial move? Are they still going to be active on the market? Mitch Kupchak also had some things to say about that. That's coming up next on the Locked On Hornets podcast. Today's episode of the Locked On Hornets podcast is brought to you by Hungry Root. Hungry Root is the easiest way to get fresh, high-quality food delivered to your door. They've got the healthy groceries and the simple recipes all together in one place. Convenience, folks. That's what we're looking for. Take a fun, short quiz, and Hungry Root will get to know you, your goals, and how you like to eat. They'll ask what flavors you like, which kitchen appliances you use, and more. And then they'll keep your needs and preferences top of mind and start building your cart with delicious recipes and all your grocery needs for the week. That's what I love. They love. They get to know you, and then they they deliver food. See, I got to think about the Hornets, okay? And that takes a lot of my headspace. So it's nice when a company like Hungry Root can come along and say, listen, just take this quiz and we'll feed you. That's it. It's simple. It's good. (laughs) Hungry Root goes beyond your weekly grocery haul with thousands of easy recipes that actually put your groceries to good use before they get forgotten in the back of your fridge. Right now, Hungry Root is offering Locked On Hornets listeners 40% off your first delivery and free veggies for life. Just go to HungryRoot.com slash LockedOn, all one word, to get 40% off your first delivery and get your free veggies. Fruit salad, yummy, yummy. That's HungryRoot.com forward slash LockedOn. Don't forget to use your link so that they know that we sent you. More Locked On Hornets ahead. Thanks for making Locked On Hornets your first listen uh, every day. I don't know if I even mentioned who I am at the top of the show, so if you've hung with me this long and didn't know who I am, uh, hopefully you're impressed. I'm Doug Branson from everyhornetsboxscore.com. That's a sub stack, and I cover every single game. You can get my game notes and more of my thoughts there, including on this game that they have tonight against the Pistons, which I will talk about in a moment. But I want to get back to some of these Cupcheck quotes. So someone asked uh, Cupcheck whether the pairing of LaMelo and Terry played a factor in moving Terry Rozier. B- because... You know, they bring in Terry not knowing, obviously, that they were going to luck into that third overall pick. And then you bring in LaMelo, and all of a sudden you've got two guards who are great scoring guards, and Terry would end up developing into a guard that you could also count on to make plays for others. But neither of those guys were really noted for their prowess on the defensive end. They had issues. And, and they continue to have issues. And I think Terry improved a little bit as a defender. I think LaMelo has improved a little bit as a defender. But, you know, typically when you have an elite scoring guard like LaMelo, you, if, you, if your intentions are to make the playoffs and win in the playoffs, you typically will surround that player at the guard and the three position with guys that are really good wing defenders. And that... Terry was an effort defender for sure, but but certainly had some issues. Here's what Mitch Kupchak said. Yeah, I wouldn't say there's been a lot of discussion. They seem to me to have played pretty well together. They both had great success. And from a productivity point of view, they both put up career numbers every year. 
So that really wasn't a big part of this. And sometimes, even if it were, there's sometimes there's not much you can do about it, right? But that was not a focus, no. Well, there is some, so that's the quote. Well, there is something you can do about it. You can trade Terry Rozier, and that's what they did. And again, I just think this is another example of, look, I don't know what's scarier, honestly, folks. I don't know what's scarier, that they didn't at any point in the past couple of seasons after the play-in blowout losses that were, I think, there was a primary factor there of not being able to defend on the wing or at the point of attack, more importantly. I don't know what's scarier, that they never sat down and had a discussion and went, hey, this, uh, this isn't... It didn't work in all the way. I don't know if this. I don't know if this can win in a playoff series. I, I think I, again, uh, people that watch this show are intelligent about basketball, and while they can, I, I think you can recognize that. Hey, t- what Mitch Kupchak said is true. Terry Rozier, super talented, put up career numbers. Lamelo Ball, extremely talented, super talented, awesome, put up career numbers at, at times over the past couple of seasons. Right, all of that's true. What's also true is that they were doing a lot of that without each other on the floor. We didn't get a ton of time with those two on the floor relative to when they were not on the floor together because of LaMelo's ankle injuries, because of uh, Terry Rozier's ankle injuries, because of Terry Rozier's groin issues. They've spent a lot of time, and, and one could argue that their career numbers are a result of that, that they spent a lot of time making up for the fact that the other one wasn't on the floor. But when they were on the floor together for a big game against Atlanta, that that did not work out. Didn't. And I think there were serious questions from a lot of people that watched a lot of Hornets basketball of, hey, is that ultimately going to work out? And it's why when they drafted Brandon Miller, you know, a lot of folks were looking at that and saying that Brandon Miller is the fit. Terry Rozier is not the fit. If they truly felt that LaMelo Ball and Terry Rozier were going to work together, they wouldn't have drafted Brandon Miller. (laughs) I mean, so again, I just, I feel like we're sitting here. We all know the deal. I'm, I don't know, 70% sure that Mitch Kupchak actually does know the deal. And and there's just not a level of clarity and honesty that come from some of these, from these, some of these things that are said. And it's not, they're not, and I'm not calling anyone a liar. This is not about lying. This is about just clouding the, clouding the truth, essentially. Or, you know, not being able to really come to terms with, accept, and then communicate the fact that there were um, these issues. He was also asked about the financial aspect of this and what they're going to do next. When asked about the finances, uh, he said Terry had a couple of years remaining on his contract and Kyle Lowry is an expiring contract, so that money will be freed up. It's always good to be flexible financially. It will help us this summer, and of course, it'll help us in the next couple of weeks to plan for this summer and beyond, just to know what our numbers are going to look like. And the pick itself has incredible potential upside for us. So we don't know who that player may be several years down the road, but an asset that valuable can also become something that you can put into a trade and make a deal. So yes, the financial part of it was a part of it, but getting the pick was probably the most important part. So if this is going to be, that, that's a quote, unquote. I gotta say unquote so you know when Mitch Kupchak is, or I do the impression, but it's a, I've, I've got these long blocks of text and if I do the impression, I'm just gonna ruin my voice. So we didn't talk a ton about that yesterday. The factor of you get the first round pick and yes, it's protected in 2027 for lottery purposes. And so you're hoping that, you know, Miami competes for the next few years, stumbles and falls, and they need to go through a rebuild themselves. And it happens a little bit quicker. And then that becomes a lottery pick, and then you shift over into 2028, and it becomes unprotected. But you only hope that if you're not able to move that pick in combination with a couple of other picks to bring in actual actual all-star level talent. Because we've seen it over and over. You want an all-star? You want a Rudy Gobert? You want a Drew Holiday? You want a James Harden? You want a da-da-da? Here's what it's going to cost you. you. You want a Damian Lillard. Here's what it's going to cost you. Multiple first-round picks. If you do want to retool, 
if you don't want to rebuild for the next decade after not winning a playoff series in 22 years, after not winning a playoff game since 2016, if you want to do those things, then you're going to have to give up some first round picks. Something that the Hornets have not been able, not been willing to do except when they have multiple first round picks and then they trade one of those picks for a worse first round pick. That's only, that's only time. <laughs> the only time when they've been willing to trade a first round pick is when they want to make that first round pick worse. So the financial piece of this is important, but what's unsaid here is you can clean the Hornets books all you want. What are you going to do with that cap space? You have to hit a cap floor, right? You, there's a certain amount of money that you have to pay every year. That amount changes, it goes up with the cap, just like the just like the ceiling, right? You have to spend some money. And so then it's like, do you do you spend that money on overpaying low to mid-level talent? Do you try to go after a big fish? But the problem with going after a big fish is that big fishes want to swim in nice waters. Big fishes don't want to swim in muddy ponds. And that's what the Hornets have created because they have spent years believing that a young core was better than it was. And so that's just the reality of it. It's not about Charlotte. It's not about how many buildings they have or how many nice restaurants they have or the fact that it's in uh, a state with bad, uh, or not bad, but a state with state income taxes, unlike Florida and some of these other places. Those are factors. But the biggest factor is that players talk, agents talk, front office executives talk, and the, the, the talk of the Hornets is that they haven't figured out what they're doing yet. And to go there is to be a part of that. And unless you have such an inflated ego that you feel like, no, I can be the answer, but you would need to, to, to feel that, I feel like you would need some like emotional connection to the city of Charlotte. You would need to be a Steph Curry. You would need to say, I can be the answer and I want, I desire to be the answer because, um, because I love that city or because I went to school in North Carolina. I, there's not a lot of players that fit that bill. So then you're talking about trading for someone to fill that cap space. Now that's certainly an option. And that's where you know having that pick and possibly being willing to give up picks in the future, 2027, 2028, 2029 futures, that's where that suddenly becomes a factor. That's when I'll believe that it's a retool. When they start giving up first round picks for players, then you're retooling. But if you're using those picks, you're rebuilding. If you're retooling, you're using those picks and you're trading those picks for better players. He was also asked, are you still going to be active on the market? And he said, yeah, we will be. This is early. I'm sure everybody or most people on this call weren't expecting something this far out from the trade deadline. So this is a little early. And one of the benefits of having done something early is that you've got more information now and we can look at opportunities knowing what we've just done. So yeah, the trade deadline is still a week or so away and we will continue to be active. And I expect, unquote, and I expect that activity to revolve around Kyle Lowry's expiring contract. Can you move that at all for any kind of asset? Kyle Lowry is older. Level of play has significantly dropped off and didn't leave Miami with like a great relationship. Could there be a reu- you know, a final reunion in Toronto as they set their rebuild? Is there is there money? Is there a contract that Toronto wants to dump? You know, that's a situation that I think, you know, if they could make it work, but the Hornets are going to have to not only eat the contract, they're probably, it's probably going to be a future, future, future second rounder, right? It's not going to be like next year's second rounder. So what are they willing, you know, what are they willing to do there? And then Gordon Hayward, what, what team is going to investigate his injury situation? The left calf strain that he's current, that has currently kept him out for weeks and say, okay, we'll take that on. And and w- will it be a team that wants to do that because they believe he'll get healthy and contribute to them late in the season? Look, he hasn't played a lot of games. <laughs> I mean, you know. Um, so he'll be fresher. 
but you've got to investigate that and figure out, you know, what, what that situation is and when he could return. Or will it be a team, you know, another rebuilding team that wants to, um, you know, file that money away. And then, of course, the Hornets can always eat that money and, and then clear the books. But then you're right back to where I began this began this segment. What do you do with that money at that point? Um, because whether or not you want to admit it or not, you are rebuilding. So, okay, that's going to do it for the conversation around Mitch Kupchak's comments. Let me know what you think in the YouTube comments or on uh, Twitter at Locked On Hornets. I'm at Doug Branson, L O H. Coming up on the Locked On Hornets podcast, the Hornets do play basketball tonight. I'll talk a little bit about what the rotation could look like, who's going to sub in for Terry Rozier and take those minutes, take those shots, and they play the Pistons. So the Hornets win. The Hornets have won two out of the past three games, folks. And Terry Rozier did. I mean, he had key buckets in the fourth quarter of that Minnesota game, no doubt about it. That he was part of that victory, but it wasn't the you know Terry Rozier level of play that we were used to and it was obvious he knew what was going on and so it was weird to kind of get out there and uh the hornets uh were forced in that game to take some of terry's shots because he wasn't as willing to put it up in the first three quarters so we'll talk more about that coming up on the locked on hornets podcast This episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, vroom vroom, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million, with an M, parts for your number one ride or die you'll always find exactly what you're looking for and with ebay guaranteed fit your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or guess what you get your money back because with ebay motors you're burning rubber not cash cash with all the parts you need at the prices you want it's easy to turn your car into the mvp (laughs) you're the real you're my mvp and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. This episode is also brought to you by FanDuel. The NFL regular season has wrapped. We are in playoff mode, and there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet, like live same-game parlays. Find bets uh, in the new Explore tab. And I'll tell you what, right now, I'm going to go take a look at this line for the Detroit game because I think it's going to be one of the rare opportunities for the Hornets uh, to actually be favored in a game. And they're actually not. This game is in Detroit, and the Hornets are two-and-a-half-point dogs against the Pistons. Okay, I don't want to do my segment before the segment, so I'll, I'll uh, stay tuned because I'm going to talk about that line uh, coming up, but make sure that if you want to bet that line, you do it with FanDuel. Make a parlay on the Parlay Hub. Visit fanduelcom locked on. Make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. More Locked On Hornets ahead. I really did expect to click on FanDuel and look at the line, and the Hornets be favored in this game. <laughs> I really did. I did. Uh, But they are not. Minus two and a half to the Detroit Pistons, who, uh, may I remind you, have won all of uh, four games uh, this season. And uh, they are on track to have the worst winning percentage in NBA history. They did get a somewhat recent win against the Washington Wizards. Uh, But folks, this is a team four and 39 right now. They're two and 20 at home. They're two and 19 away. Now, One of those four victories, and this may be affecting the line, this may be where Vegas looks at this and says, team's emotional right now, a lot of outpouring of support for uh, Terry Rozier. He is, uh, was, you know, an emotional leader, a heart and soul of the team. You rip that out. How do they respond? Is this a team that is going to bounce back and say, all right, 
moving on, get all that out of the way. We're going to go out and win a ball game. And you go up against a team in Detroit. One of the few wins was against Charlotte early, early, early in the season. And they did it in a way that is was physical, was uh, what there was some toughness involved with Detroit kind of taking it right into the teeth of the Hornets defense and blocking shots and a lot of things that the Hornets are still somewhat vulnerable to. Now, they didn't have Miles Bridges at the time, and there's no doubt about it that Miles Bridges coming back does offer them more physicality than they have had. But you don't, you still don't know what Nick Richards' status is. Is he going to move from you know, out to questionable back into the lineup. Because if he doesn't, you know, then you're depending, you're still depending on PJ and you're still depending on Nathan Mensa. And I don't, you're, you're not going to have a situation like in Minnesota where you have Carl Anthony Towns just getting completely selfish and avoiding everyone else. You know, Detroit is capable of scoring the basketball and they do move the ball around a little bit. It's just, it's super inconsistent and they don't play any defense. Like they've had close games against good teams. It's not it's not as if they've bl- been blown out in those 39 losses every single game. They're capable of putting up numbers and they've tasted teal and purple blood already this season. They when you're when you I'm sure when you're a team that has lost as many games, morale is pretty low. And you look on the schedule and you look and you say, "Well, we play Charlotte. Well, we've already beaten Charlotte." You know, a team that probably doesn't have a lot of belief all of a sudden, they've just got a little morsel of belief to hang on to when they see Charlotte on the schedule because that was one of their rare victories. So for the Hornets, this is an opportunity to say, no, things have changed since then. We're more organized on offense. We're playing better defense, which is true, which is true. They 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 were able to play incredible defense against Philadelphia in that loss, played better defense in the second game against San Antonio in a win. And while you allowed 125 points to the Minnesota Timberwolves, that's one of the best offense, well, one of the best teams in the league. And they have guys that can fill it up, including Carl Anthony Towns, who scored 60 plus on you. And you still were able to get more points than them. And in the fourth quarter, you played great defense. You held that team to 16 points in the fourth quarter when it mattered most. This team has been playing a little bit better. And so this would be, if if they are going to have any kind of improvement for the rest of the way, this would be an opportunity to say, for once this season, we are not going to play down to the level of our competition. Because this, like when you, even without Terry Rozier, you look up and down this roster and you say, if Lamelo's healthy, if Brandon's healthy, if Miles is healthy, and if you get back Nick Richards... And, you know, maybe Cody Martin as well, who banged knees. And hopefully that doesn't keep him out long because they could use, you know, an extra wing now with Terry gone. Then you should be able to beat this team. And in terms of the lineup, I mean, I think Brandon was already starting and playing alongside Terry. I think Brandon and it's either Brandon Miller Cody Martin, Brandon Miller, Bryce McGowan's, those are your wings. You've got LaMelo up top, you've got two wings, and then, you know, Miles and PJ teaming up if Nick Richards is unable to go. I mean, I think that's your starting lineup. And uh, I think that, you know, if Nick Richards is back, then PJ will slot um, immediately back, unless they could go PJ at four. Because Detroit does, you know, they, they can put a little size on the floor. So if he wanted to, you know, upsize that starting lineup, then you can go P.J. at the four, go uh, Miles at three, and then uh, Richards at, at five. But then, you know, you're really hoping at that point that the bench is able to step up in a very similar way that they stepped up against Minnesota. And that was incredible. What the bench did against Minnesota, what J.T. Thor, Leaky Black, I love Leaky! what uh, Ish Smith was able to do in the middle of the game, what NSJ was able to do. NSJ won't, will not start. Um, oh, well, at least I don't think so. But he, he's he got to get more minutes at this point without Terry Rozier. I mean, it's just a sort of a natural like, hey, what is what did you lose with this guy? What do you have with this other guy that you haven't been playing as much? Like, just sort of feels 
like he's going to get more minutes. So if you're a big NSJ fan, then then you should be excited about this particular move. Okay, that's going to do it for the Locked On Hornets podcast. We will be back tomorrow, uh, hopefully alongside Walker Mail, to talk about the Pistons game, recapping that and getting more thoughts as the Hornets uh, get closer to the February deadline, trade deadline, and see if they make some more moves. Thanks so much for listening, uh, making us your first listen. Now check out Locked On Sports Today live on YouTube. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows like Locked On NBA covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. Uh, For Walker and uh, all the crew that makes this show happen, uh, I'm saying go Hornets, go America, let's swarm Charlotte. Bye-bye.